explain to you uh, based on uh, my side, uh, which, uh, which is limited, but I will do what I can. So let's look at the initial words. The wisdom of unobstructed dharma is the complete understanding of all teachings and unhindered discernment of all principles. Okay, well, I'll come to that. I'll come to this line, and because very important is to distinguish this one from this one here. The wisdom of unobstructed meaning is the knowledge of all teachings and unobstructed comprehension of the principles. Now, if you look at the first glance of what is said here, unhindered discernment of all principles, then unobstructed comprehension of the principles that sound the same, right? But there is the difference, I'll come to that. The wisdom of un unobstructed rhetoric is proficiency in every kind of language and ability to teach them, uh, teaching them at will. We'll come to that. The wisdom of unobstructed joy in speaking is a teaching of the Dhammas, meaning perfectly without hindrance and with the joy, eloquence, and freedom. I think this last line is easier to understand. Okay. So for unobstructed wisdom, understand all teachings and principles to the extent of categorizing them. I, I, I like this part here to the extent of categorizing them. Now, Dharma is profound, is vast. If I were to say, share with you all um, about the journey of life, what, where, where am I gonna get, what, what, what are the teachings I need to apply and things like that? So one who understand very well, it's one who can actually um, explain it and categorize them in a manner that the person listening is able to discern um, that very before one can do that, one got to be able to understand all teachings and principles. So if you recall then, um, I have given you four stages of, uh, of understanding or growing in the Dharma. So one is to know, second is to understand third is uh, to realize and the last one is practice now to know to know is purely based on the um, uh, capacity or one uh, capacity of the mind to understand uh, is purely based on the capability of the intelligence to, to understand but realizing and this is where the difference is to realize the principles, uh, that's the one that distinguishes the, 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 the growth. Un, to know and understand the teachings is one, but to realize the principles. This is the principles cannot be understood, it has to be realized. Okay? Now, once you do, is able to do that, then one will be able to categorize them because you will understand what the principles mean and understand its application. Only then you can go to unobstructed meaning. This, only then when you realize that, then you compre comprehend the principles that are taken to heart. Taken to heart means you're actually engaging that into your life, into your practice. So this is purely here, the understanding from the mind point of view and to realize, and here applying it, they're moving with the Dharma and then the unobstructed meaning, because obviously uh, as you then live the life, you're living the life in the Dharma. That's the reason why, if you recall, I mentioned to you all that understand what is your purpose of life, answer the purpose, then you can engage into a meaningful practice. If you remember, I said that before. So that is where the main distinguishing factor between un un unobstructed Dharma and un unobstructed meaning. So meaning full practice in your life. Okay. So this one, uh, uh, obviously, uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't even call this uh, theory is more than theory because the principles 
uh, have to be contemplated upon for you to really have this unobstructed dharma. Then when you do that, your life will change because then you understand what is your purpose of life and then you engage in the practice and then that's where the uh, practice become meaningful. Unobstructed rhetoric and mastery, mastery all language to truly understand the meanings and express. Now, if you remember the chapter that Master explained on the transcendent power uh, of the Buddha, it transcends all languages. So, um, therefore, he obviously in the context of a modern understanding at the moment, different languages, and therefore it's being listened to do the words. So therefore, if you, again, um, I've shared with you before, words are worldly construct. If the words contain the meaning of the truth, the words is just an expression. So those um, beings who have highly developed in the faculties, they don't listen to the words. They listen to the meanings, that's the difference. And that is the transcendent power of the Buddha is able to do that. So, the, um, um, so don't, don't try to understand in the literal sense, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, if even even uh, practitioners, some highly evolved practitioners, even now, um, they can listen to sound and make just miles away. Um, so that, and, and, they, and because then they already transcended through the worldly medium. Okay. Unobstructed joy in speaking and perfectly explains the Dharma in an appropriate way. And this is the one that is, comes from your inner development. And this inner development can only come when your character is transformed. Before your character is transformed, your consciousness must be transformed first. Okay, so obviously, one who can attain this um, is already um, towards the door of an enlightenment. Um, so you can imagine how uh, far reaching it can be. So if you, um, I, I always wonder when uh, Master say, um, when he started speaking on the Lotus Sutra, 5,000 uh, disciples left. Now, for those who have been to Boucher's Peak, it's a very small place. And um, I'm just trying to think how inconceivable it is to cater for 5,000 uh, uh, disciples. Uh, but maybe the 5,000 is expressed in a manner as a, as a metaphor. Um, to, ex to explain the extent uh, um, what it means uh, in the context of this, of uh, the impact of people living rather than a literal sense. That's why sometimes um, in this um, Dharma, we need to understand the words, like I say, words um, are inadequate uh, to explain. So you need to go behind the words uh, to understand that. And this is all about contemplation, it's all about going to the understand the principle, but words are just leading you. It cannot describe the principles. So then the other, um, the other um, intriguing thought that I had was um, when I visited uh, Jetta Grove, um, I was, I went to the platform on which uh, the Buddha was believed to have made those teachings. And I was standing, I was sitting there and then standing away. You know, 2,500 years ago, I don't believe there was any microphones. Have you ever wondered how they can listen? You know, I have difficulty listening. I, I'm, I'm a start with, I'm partially deaf. I'm difficult listening even within a room, right? With distance away from the front of the back of the room. Imagine in the open air. Have you ever wondered how the disciples can listen? You know, so you then start and you contemplate on that, the power of the Buddha when he speak. So forget about even forget, let's say only on one language that one can understand. How can the teaching of the Buddha 
at the platform, which is the one sitting, forget about the first row, second row, third row, okay? Even at the fourth, fifth row, to be able to listen well uh, to the Buddha. And, and this, is, this is all about the mind development. It's about development to be able to listen with your inner faculties, to have inner hearing. When you have the inner hearing, it transcends languages. And that's a different. So that's why invisible beings can even come and listen. Will they, do they understand uh, Pali or whatever language it may be? So these are the experiential learning that as you grow into the practice, you begin to, to understand that. Um, so that's why when you read um, this, you then understand ah, this is what it's referring to. So, but if you are then apply the worldly intellectual mind to understand, you can never realize um, what this is. And there's a reason why what is meant by unobstructed dharma um, to understand those principles. Okay. So those who thus understand the Tripitaka achieve the three flawless studies. Sutra treasury contains the teaching of the study of Samadhi. What has Sutra then got to do with Samadhi? Samadhi is going to, right, the meditative state of mind. But then you talk about a Sutra. Now that relates back to the unobstructed Dharma because the Sutra, to understand, remember the Sutra I just mentioned, those words are worldly words. Uh, if you like, they are just signs, they're just symbols. But what you need to do is to understand the principles. That's why to understand the principle, you can't be understanding that without going to Samadhi. You better go into contemplation because then you can only have a worldly understanding and a worldly knowing of the teachings. Um, and um, that is why the Sutra Treasury contains teaching of the study of Samadhi because you can never understand the sutra if you understand as a academic text um, and, and will hard to go anywhere. And this like, what do you mean by this mastery of all languages? So Vinaya treasure could need to study of precepts. So Vinaya, Vinaya uh, rules have, I think I explained uh, to you um, the, um, uh, the, the um, the disciple of the Buddha, Upala, who actually was the master of the head of drafting and upholding the Vinaya rules. So Vinaya rules, obviously for the mass monastic, there are two, 300 uh, uh, rules to comply with, but for, for us, we are only have a few. Um, we only got five uh, given by the Buddha, and then in Sushi, we have 10. But more importantly, we need to understand in this context, that when this teaching, this teaching comes about, this teaching to be not your meant to apply to the monastics, then we then have to ask ourselves, what does that mean to us as a lay practitioner? What does it mean to us as a householder in practice? And therefore, for you to understand this, that you better understand who you are. If you do not understand who you are, how can you then know what precepts to keep for yourself? Abhidhamma continues the study of wisdom because Abhidhamma explains about the principles and the canons of, uh, of the teachings of the, of the Dharma. And this is the one that enables you to then contemplate and, and practice here unobstructed meaning, right? Take into heart and then be able to apply that meaningful in life. And that's the experiential learning that can enable you to live the wisdom life to grow in wisdom. So that's my limited understanding. The 12 divisions of Tripitaka. The pros are restricted uh, in number of characters and because the lines are long, they are called long form pros. Okay, this is a description of what the, but if you notice that, uh, most must also understand that, uh, the things, uh, all the texts that we have today, do you know that none of them, none of them were written by the Buddha? So we need to therefore, so understand that very well. And uh, so whatever characters, texts you read today, none of them were written by the Buddha. 
And then you're going to extend beyond that. Did Jesus write the Bible? He didn't write the Bible either. Did Prophet Muhammad wrote the Quran? He did not. Did Moses um, write the Ten Commandments? He did not. So none of these great religious did write anything down. You see, to them, these great religious uh, leaders, they are, they are realized beings, they are high beings. And they know the workings of our mind, that how we can misinterpret those words. Because they say, the quote, I say it's written by the Buddha, and that's what it says. Um, and um, that's why we have lawyers, right? Lawyers are meant to interpret words in different ways to their advantage. So imagine if this was written down, how the, our mind can twist and turn those words to suit our own and not the real meaning. So that's the reason why I go back to this part here, unobstructed meaning. Because this unobstructed meaning has gone beyond words already. So we've gone beyond words. Languages is no longer an issue. It's only the meaning that is being communicated across. So therefore, you understand this then, obviously, and this is a repeated verse. The repeated verse, and sometimes um, we got to express it in a different manner. And, um, and, and this verse is something, obviously, uh, would uh, um, say that, obviously, is recorded the best way to remember by the, by the disciple, which in the case of Ananda. Um, and, and this is repeated and expressed in the way. way. It's the same way I want to describe an object, how it looks like, you see from one angle and then describe in a manner so that you can have a visualization in your mind. But how can you describe um, enlightenment to an enlightened mind? It's impossible. So therefore, it can allow you, uh, allow us to understand a, an, a facet of what that gem of enlightenment is. Uh, independent but stands on its own. Um, you better end a reference to other verses or other texts. Um, causes and conditions you should understand. Now, previous lives of disciples, and these are the examples that were given, um, which you all understand because uh, Master has been sharing uh, uh, with us of, um, uh, you know, the, uh, what you call that, um, uh, disciples' um, affinity he had with uh, some of the disciples and Sariputra, uh, with the dog, if you remember. So these are uh, uh, the stories to, to illustrate um, the karmic connections and how the disciples came about where and, and, and do that particular life with the Buddha. And the previous lives of the Buddha was sleep uh, that contains a lot in the Lotus Sutra uh, and um, and uh, the past forms of bodhisattvas that he took before he attained full enlightenment or the supreme enlightenment. So these are all the uh, we need to understand this because you tell us how the affinity came about. So because we are not enlightened, uh, your affinity and my affinity that we're coming together on the Zoom, um, how they come about, uh, we, do, we do not know, but we know that it comes from an affinity. So therefore, this will show us there is an affinity. It didn't come to us by accident. So the lives of the of past lives of the, of the Buddha is to show what is the journey? What sort of cultivation that we need uh, to take? Even at the bodhisattva level, uh, lifetime after lifetime, different forms of bodhisattvas because it's there to perfect those virtues and wisdom. And so the enlightened supreme enlightenment, when it's perfected every virtue, perfected every wisdom uh, in the practice. What never existed before, existed before, isn't it? I'm wondering what this line means. Sutras recording the inclusive matters of Buddha manifests manifests manifesting various spiritual powers. What never existed before existed before. This is show. This is the line that tells us that the truth of the Dharma has been there since the beginningless time. Okay, so um, and um, so this the so does divinity accept that. Um, through the decay of the Kalpa, the deep couple of Kalpa that were in past teachings of the Buddha have been lost until Sakyamuni Buddha came. So that's one is to revive us, to let us know. Analogies are born of skillful means. 
that I would not talk to that we understand because how can one explain, like I say, an enlightenment is, the enlightened mind, how can you explain uh, what a bohemian glass looks like to someone who hasn't seen a bohemian glass? So you could describe that it is a glass, but then a color that being carved. So um, these are analogies. Explanation of doctrines, um, which uh, you understand. Unrequested teaching, um, obviously these are teachings, uh, they'll come up because uh, something that have uh, triggered about. Uh, Sometimes it does happen when you meet a great master and um, these, uh, usually when teachings are, are being, when you learn from an enlightened one or a great master, you have to request all the teachings. So these are teachings which are unrequested and they come along. So this why, that's why when we walk the path, sometimes with a great master, um, you got to listen very tentatively um, what the master would say, because sometimes they do have unrequested teachings. So broad teachings uh, contain uh, proper vast and great truths taught by the Buddha. And uh, obviously this, obviously this are, uh, um, the, for example, uh, the, the broad teaching, the Four Noble Truth, but then the Four Noble Truth, and you, you understand deeper and deeper into that, there's so much to the Four Noble Truth. And everything else uh, can, relates back to the Four Noble Truth. Prophecies or predictions of the Buddha, obviously you also understand that, and what uh, Master already shared a number of times um, on what the prophecy of the Buddha, the Dharma, degenerating age that we are in, um, how the um, Dharma would, uh, and in India and goes to the east and went to China, but they did also, if I remember correctly, um, but also predicted that Dharma will return back to India from outside. And also the predictions of Buddha, uh, of Buddhahood, um, that also refers to uh, Sariputra and a number of uh, the other disciples as well. So contemplation, the spiritual consciousness is unconfined. There is no self but there is a greater self, the wondrous existence of the self. So what do you mean by there's no self? You see, self has an ego, self has self-interest, self has self-centeredness. But if you rise above that self, then you leave the self behind, then you get into a greater self. And that greater self is the wondrous existence of the self that we need to realize of what is the purpose and the meaningful meaning of this particular life, which is relating to the unobstructed meaning and understanding of the Dharma. Owing to the unconfined state of spiritual consciousness, the wisdom realization is unobstructed and in oneness of the universe. And that, when you realize that, obviously, um, it is as vast as the universe, I think everything else one at the same. There are no boundaries to wisdom. If there are no boundaries to wisdom, then but the self has a boundary because self, myself, yourself, that alone is already a boundary. So you want to understand that we've got to lose the boundary, you want to lose the boundary, then there must be no self. Then the, become, the wisdom becomes impartial and there is only one true wisdom and irrespective of what condition it may be. And relationship, unobstructive relationship. One needs to overcome the unobstructive relationships in the spiritual journey. And it is, um, you want to, um, to dig down, to have impartial wisdom, to have uh, vast wisdom, you cannot see a relation to being, uh, uh, being obstructive. Because if it, if it is, then the presence of self will obstruct you and hinder you from understanding the vastness of the teaching or the, um, of the unobstructed meaning of the Dharma. So these obstacles are self-obstructions, the barriers, that one put up knowingly or unknowingly. These some obstructions that we have. Um, uh, it could be the lines that we draw um, or by character, or by looks, by color, by creed, by backgrounds, so on and so forth, or by intelligence, uh, as which some of us do. So, and, and knowing unknowingly, that's why in the practice, you got to be able to understand your mind. You got to be able to observe yourself. Otherwise, it's hard to realize the principles um, in the Dharma because of the self obstructions that we have. 
So we learn to lose the self in you. Without the boundary of the self, your wisdom growth can expand, elevate, and evolve inconceivably. Um, and that is where um, the main key point that Master is trying to teach uh, today, to have that understanding of that meaning. Because if we don't be able to evolve, um, before you can evolve, we need to elevate. Before you can elevate, we need to expand. And this is about our consciousness that we have. So the extent of the growth will depend on the courage and the strength of your vows to be in practice. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think Brother Robert has left. Oh, that's true. And, that's true. Uh, <laughs>